Um, I'm going to be talking about my work with Wild Crew, with specifically Lion Landscapes, talking, as David mentioned, about coexistence between people and large carnivores, specifically big cats. Now, big cats have always been deeply valued in human culture. For as long as people have existed, they have really revered and valued these animals. So we can see that the first figurative art that people carved out of woolly mammoth ivory about 40,000 years ago um, up here was the lion man. So it was the head of a lion on a human body. And similarly, if you go to the cave art about 30,000 years ago in France, there's extensive depictions of lions, you know, tableaus that any one of us would recognize the sort of behavior that we see in places like the Serengeti today. So it had huge symbolism for the people living with big cats then. And it is still used extensively today. Depictions of big cats are everywhere you look, particularly with things like the military, with luxury brands, um, with sports teams, all kinds of things really celebrate big cats as the central inspirational point. And that's because they have multiple different values that really resonate with people today. They have, as we will know, many of us being ecologists sitting here, have really important ecological value. If you have big cats in a landscape, then you have enough habitat, you have sufficient prey to maintain these apex predators. They also have really important economic value through things like um, photo tourism and trophy hunting where they generate revenue for the range countries in which they occur. And beyond all of that, they have existence value. So this is value that people ascribe to big cats just because they love to know they live in a world that is still wild enough to have tigers and lions and things out there living wild and free, even if they never get to be lucky enough to see them. And for me, I've always been fascinated by big cats for as long as I can remember. There's no real reason for this. I grew up in Devon. The biggest cat was a slightly aggressive tabby at the end of the street. But actually, my brother and I buried a memory box in our old house in Devon. And in it, we said what we wanted to be doing at the then unimaginable age of 30. And mine, when we found it again, like 20 years later, uh, mine had two things in it. So I wasn't very imaginative. But one of them said I wanted to be in the Serengeti studying lions. And the second thing was that I wanted a zebra-striped Land Rover. <laughs> now, going from there and sort of the 10-year-old's ambitions to actually how you make this a career is, you know, is quite daunting. So it's not like being a medical doctor where there's a very clear path through. You have to figure out your own path. And as soon as I started to look into big cat conservation in particular, I realized there was only one place that I really wanted to do it. And that was the Wildlife Conservation Research Unit here at Oxford. Because after all my reading about it, and I was a complete fan of David's and re you know, watching the Velvet Claw and all of these sorts of things. And I realized that the second you walked into Wild Crew, you basically got handed a big cat. So here was David and Andy um, with a lion, David with a cheetah, Arjun with a tiger, um, Andy with a clouded leopard. So I was like, this is my natural home. So I went, had an interview with David, which we won't go into, it went horribly. But, um, but still persuaded him eventually to give me this Jerwood Scholarship, which was based here. And uh, I walked in and I was like, what, you know, which big cat am I going to get to study? And he said, I want you to study the water shrew. And I was like, mm, okay, okay. Got to start somewhere. And this is big for a shrew. It's the biggest of the shrews. But it is about 15,000 times smaller than a lion. So, you know, I was like, okay, things can only get bigger. And they did uh, with the water vole. And that was quite exciting. And David strongly tried to steer me towards doing a PhD on water voles, which I strongly resisted. And then things got bigger and even scarier with a badger. This is a proper carnivore, has really scary teeth and everything, so that was exciting. But eventually I got fed up after about a year of doing this UK stuff, and I said to David I was going to leave to do a project with um, Cambridge on meerkats. Of course, no one from Oxford likes anyone to go to Cambridge. And I know that meerkats aren't actual cats, but I figured, you know, it's right there in the name. I could probably convince some Americans that they were, in fact, cats. Um, but... Eventually, David said, no, no. He said, you know, you've got to stay because this woman's starting her PhD and she wants assistance. And how about going out to help lorry market in Namibia? I was like, yes, that sounds good. So I set out to Namibia and I was meant to be there six months. And I stayed there about six years, learning all sorts of stuff about human carnival conflict and coexistence with local people. After that, I headed out to Ruaha in southern Tanzania, uh, living in this tent, which... Uh, a lion slept on me in this tent in my very first night out in the bush. It was terrifying. There's a little video about it on Nat Geo. But as I was there, I thought, this is the place to study conflict with big cats. And it's a hugely important topic to study. So there was immense amounts of killing in this area that I'll return to in a minute. But this is because despite those immense and diverse values, species like lions are really in serious trouble. So if we look at their historic range, for example, and these 
are maps and, and uh, slides that I've plagiarised entirely from Andy, so thanks, Andy. I have no idea what they actually mean, but I'm going to just go straight through that and pretend I do. But this shows the historic range of lions in the dark brown in about 1890. So at the turn of the century, there were somewhere around 200,000 lions at that point, of course. No one really knows, no one's busy counting them. But by 1970, you can see the range had really contracted down extensively. There were still, though, big areas of connectivity, and the dark blue here and the green show those areas where they're very highly connected still. So you can see the connection is really strong in East Africa and in Southern Africa in particular. By 2020, that range has contracted even further, and now, unfortunately, it's really fragmented. So there are only a few populations where you have these big connected areas and where they're unfortunately likely to be viable in the long term. Now, the main reasons, the main threats driving that decline are things like the loss of habitat and the associated loss of wild prey, especially through things like bushmeat snaring, and also human-wildlife conflict. These animals are not easy to live alongside. So all of these things have really contributed to not only push back lions and, and other species and make them into these very fragmented populations, but also mean that the resulting populations that we have now are still very fragile. So a paper that we're working on now is looking at how fragile the different populations are, and this just looks at the number of lions in each population. So the darker the blue here, um, the more lions there are. And it's really striking that even though there are over 65 remaining lion populations, around half of those populations have fewer than 50 animals. So they're very unlikely to be viable in the long term. And only six of those populations are still large ones with at least 1,000 lions left in them. And then if you also look at things like, you know, rather than just the ecology of these populations, if you look at the socio-political factors around them, it also shows that around 80% of lion range is in highly fragile countries. So we've got to consider all these other socio-political factors, particularly poverty, that are really overlaid with this if we're going to have lasting conservation. And this is something that Wild Crew really has a good history of doing. So Wild Crew has long-term projects, has very embedded projects in community land, which tackle both factors. So they look at the ecological aspects of conservation, but critically, they also look at the human dimensions of conservation. And so we've got just two examples here. There are many more, but this is the Trans-Kalahari Predator Program run by Professor Loveridge, and this is their team using vuvuzelas um, to sort of chase away lions. And the Ethiopian Wolf um, Conservation Program, which is run by um, Professor Sierro, and Lena, and this is looking at using things like wolf monitors to actually monitor these populations and really make sure that conservation is embedded in those local communities. So Lion Landscapes is a program like that, so it's a wild crew project, and it runs across three countries at the moment, Kenya, Tanzania, and Zambia. It's run by myself and Elaine Cotterill, who also graduated from Wild Crew with her PhD there. So we're the joint CEOs of this, and we, have, we originally worked in different landscapes. I worked in southern Tanzania, she worked in Kenya and Zambia, but we've combined our work so that we can collaborate and trial conservation measures across different sites. So our work works in four key landscapes now. So we've got southern Tanzania, this is the Runguruaha landscape, hugely important for lions and other large carnivores. We've got Salu Nyere, which is thought to have the biggest lion population left in the world. The Nikipia landscape, which is the third biggest population, they think, of lions left in, in Kenya and really important for other pop, uh, species like wild dogs, etc. And down in the Luangwa Valley, again, a really important strip of connectivity between particularly these national parks. And although the name is Lion Landscapes, we only use Lion Landscapes because lions are an umbrella species for so much else. So our aim as Lion Landscapes is to do several things. We want to stop the main threats to large carnivores. We also want critically to reduce the costs of living with large carnivores to the people living closest to them. And really importantly, we have to deliver meaningful benefits to people from conservation. And also, to deliver all that, we have to enable community ownership of conservation activities. And all of that requires a foundation of healthy habitat and prey populations, a good understanding of the threats, and it really depends upon properly engaging local people, not only as stakeholders, as we always hear, but shareholders in conservation. People have a true stake in this. And that's harder than you might think to do because in many of these places, the people are extremely poor. They're often living on less than a dollar a day. Food insecurity is a major concern. And there's very little access to clean water or improved sanitation. So diseases like, co like cholera and giardia and now COVID are really extensive. And there's very little or no access to improved medical care. So most people, for instance, in southern Tanzania in these landscapes live to less than 50. There's also high levels of illiteracy, particularly amongst women. 
And all of these things combined mean that people are really trapped in poverty. So they can't get out of it. They don't have the ability to you know, use literacy to get out and get an improved job. So they're really trapped in these situations. Then you, having live, you have them living cheek by jowl with some of the most important large carnivore populations left on the planet. And this is the kind of thing that happens. So a lot of these people rely extensively on livestock, not only as an economic asset, but also as a cultural asset. Really important for them. In this case, a man um, had three cattle. One of them was killed by lions. Then he, unsurprisingly, went out and killed lions in return. And this leads to extensive carnivore killing. These are just a few of the carnivores that we found um, in the first couple of years that we were working down in the Ruaha site in southern Tanzania. And as you can see, this actually was the highest recorded rate of lion mortality anywhere in East Africa in modern times. And not only was it a hugely high level of killing, it's also striking that several things were notable about, about the types of killing. So first of all, we found that many of the lion carcasses were missing their right front paw. And often the entire carcass was intact, but they were only missing that body part, and we had no idea why. The second one was that an awful lot of the animals were heavily pregnant females, particularly the ones that had been poisoned. And if there is any way of devastating this population, it is taking away adult reproductive females. So this was a huge conservation threat. There's also extensive use of poisonings, which were particularly devastating. In this incident, which resulted from the killing of one cow, led to the deaths of over 75 critically endangered vultures, six lions, and multiple other animals as well. But if you're going to try and engage people in conservation, it's often a really uphill battle. People often don't want to engage in conservation. And we were certainly told that in southern Tanzania. This is um, a member of the tribe called the Barabeg, who are known to be very secretive and very hostile and resistant to conservation in particular. We tried for two years to engage with the Barabeg with no success. They would run away from us, they wouldn't talk to us, until eventually we put up a solar panel at camp to charge our laptops. And then suddenly the Barabeg arrived to charge their cell phones. <laughs> and I couldn't believe it. I mean, I, I still, it still kills me, actually, that I didn't think of this earlier on. But of course the Barabeg were wanting the same thing that any one of us do. A power connection in the middle of the bush is really useful. Before, they had to walk about 20 kilometers to get a connection. And so the Barabeg, like us, use their phones for everything. They actually use them probably for a wider diversity of things. Everything from tracking livestock prices in the markets to saying if a child's gone missing in the bush to, you know, all the normal sending WhatsApp memes and all the rest of it that the rest of us do. And so this was a bit of a breakthrough. And combined with a few other things, we ended up being able to meet with those young warriors at camp. They came down to camp and we explained to them, we are not trying to get you in trouble. We are not the police. We are not wildlife division. All we're trying to do is understand why you're killing this many lions and then see if there's something that we could do to deliver you those benefits through conservation. And they said, fine, we will, we will work with you. And this was such a huge point for the project. We were like, yes, you know, we're finally going to get to work with the Barabeg. Within a week, those same warriors that came to that meeting went out and killed seven lions right around our camp. And we were devastated. Our guys were in tears. This was a huge low point because we really felt they were throwing everything back in our faces. I called Leela Hazar, who works on Lion Guardians in Kenya, and said, there's no way we can work with these people. I'm, I'm kind of, I'm done. And she said, this is a test. You have told them, they know you're passionate about lions and other carnivores, but you've told them you're going to work with them. And they said, they are seeing what you place a higher value on, your relationship with the community or your, or your value to lions. And so she said, you've got to do nothing. And sure enough, we did nothing. We measured the bodies. They knew we knew. And then about a week after that, they then called us and said, now we want to meet with you. And they invited us down to their tribal meeting, the first time they'd ever had Westerners at one of these meetings, and said, now we will talk to you about what actually is going on, and we want to work with you for conservation. So that was huge, and unsurprisingly, because they were so dependent upon livestock, depredation was the major issue that they were concerned about. And this can be huge. In southern Tanzania, it cost people about 18% of their annual cash income. And so it's really important for us to understand and reduce the risk of attacks on people's livestock. So a big way we do that is collaring large carnivores. This was a lion that was collared actually in the park. And everyone said, well, there's no point collaring these lions. We know they don't go out of the park. And this is the park to the north, and this is village land down here. And basically, this lion would hang around here, and everyone thought she just stayed there. But it was very obvious from the collaring that she would actually bolt out into village land, probably kill some things down here, and then race back and look all happy and you know, innocent the next day when the tourists are there to photograph her. So by doing the collaring, we got to develop a risk map um, around these sorts of places that we work. And the collaring was also, and this means that we can target our mitigation efforts so that we can reduce conflict. It was also really important, the collaring, so that we used it directly for coexistence. So rather than us just holding on to the data, 
and sort of keeping it from people and giving it out in dribs and drabs, we actually decided to engage landowners by giving them access to the collaring data in real time on their phones. And everyone said, well, this is madness. You know, people are going to go and kill them because you're going to tell them exactly where the lion is. And actually, it was the exact opposite. If people knew where the lions were, they could avoid them, they could move their livestock away from them, they felt empowered. It wasn't as much of a threat. So this was a really important way in actually bringing people on and trusting them and building those relationships with them. But still, no matter how much you understand about it, understand about the risks of conflict, that conflict is still going to happen and still going to have a really important impact on people's lives. So one of the most important things that we did was look at where the attacks were happening. And about two-thirds of the attacks were happening in poorly constructed livestock enclosures. This is a classic sort of pastoralist um, enclosure. So this is the outer boma that they call it, which is a ring usually of thornbush, an inner um, boma, which is usually where the cattle will be. There'll be small stock, and these smaller, well-fortified ones are usually things like the calves and the young small stock that are very vulnerable. But often there isn't enough thornbush. It's just not very well made. So these are often poorly protected, and that was an obvious place that we wanted to work with communities to try to reduce the risk. So we worked with them by um, produce, giving them access to wire, and this was done on a cost-sharing basis. We didn't want to just give it to people sort of 100%, because then people don't invest in things and don't value it. So we did this cost-sharing um, program so that they can actually fortify their enclosures. And now this looks rubbish. If you walked into a zoo and that was their lion enclosure, you would obviously walk straight out again and call the police, probably. But and so we thought, well, we're going to have to start with this, then we're going to do the next one, and we're going to have to you know, do some extra, you know, extra kind of high fences and maybe additional thornbush. Actually, these fences were really, really good. They reduced attacks by about 95%. And, um, and we've seen not only do they reduce attacks in the target bomers, but they also bizarrely reduce attacks in the neighbouring bomers. So this is before and after. These are three months before and after the um, fortification. And the red line there is the improved boma, and it, it's gone down a lot. But also, it affects the neighbouring bomas. And this is a consistent pattern. So I'm not sure why. The only thing we can think is that maybe carnivores would come, be attracted to these poor bomas, and then constantly hit there. And then maybe if they weren't having this attractant, they would, they would not even hang around those spots and affect the uh, neighbours. But it's just interesting that, that it can have these wider implications. But what you don't want to do is reinforce people's livestock enclosures and then just have slightly hungrier carnivores waiting outside when they let all their livestock out to graze the next day. So then drawing on um, the experience that I had in Namibia with working with guarding dogs, we decided to try and bring livestock guarding dogs into these um, landscapes. And originally this was, there was a lot of resistance to this. Lots of people here have um, dogs, but they never used them for anything. And at one point we were sitting at a village meeting and our two camp dogs were there. And they were getting in the way, so I, we told them to sit in Swahili. And the dog sat, which was startling. And uh, everyone stopped. And they said, we said, what's wrong? And they said, where did you get the magic dogs? <laughs> and we said, what do you mean? And they said, those dogs speak Swahili. And we said, well, well we actually used to speak to them in English. They were like, they speak English? <laughs> and, uh, and then we spent a long time talking about how you could actually train dogs. And then people would, there's this whole thing that developed. People thought we were like dog whisperers. And um, but that opened the door so we can actually bring in real magic dogs, which are these Anatolian shepherds, and these have a long... Yeah, everyone says, no, oh, it's so cute. That's not what the farmers say. When, the farmers, when you give them to them, they're like, what? Have you seen a lion? This is like a canopy. <laughs> and so, but they do grow very big and scary, and actually a bit too big and scary. So you know, you're dealing with very insecure households, food insecure households. So feeding a dog like this, we would feed it for the first year. But actually, you know, dealing with this is very hard over time, so it's something we had to think about how you would expect people to manage dogs like this. So the dogs do work though, they've protected against lions, so that was the first test of showing that they could do that. We also, though, many of these pastoralists are traditional remote past, um, nomadic pastoralists, so we also wanted mobile bomas. This is something that we went to another of the Wild Crew projects, Andy's project, and our team went and learned from them in how to do these canvas bomas that you could move around. And these are not only really effective at preventing livestock depredation, but they also, interestingly, tackle food insecurity because, and this is a shamelessly stolen slide from Andy, we do have similar pictures, so I'm not lying, but I just couldn't find them in time. Um, so these basically show that where you've had the livestock sort of stamping in the, uh, the dung and everything here compared to outside, you end up with a lot more, obviously a lot more crops growing, the crops tend to be bigger, so you have more food security. 
Now, we also work with the existing sort of frameworks in an area. So, for example, in the Kenyan conservancies, there are ranges that are already on the landscape, and so we've used them as lion ranges to try to ensure that there's a collective human-wildlife conflict res um, response happening rapidly across those landscapes. And those ranges also play an important role in doing what we call coexistence co-op. So this is working strongly with the communities to co-develop solutions so that they really feel they can have the training and the knowledge and the ability to actually reduce conflict. So we know we can reduce depredation. But we've done extensive work, and there are numerous papers on this, showing that, that depredation, even though it's the thing that everyone talks about first when you talk to them about carnivores in particular, there are many, many other things that affect conflict with wildlife. And a few of those in here were things like the lack of meaningful equitable benefits. This was a huge one. There were also cultural issues about money and status. And this was hugely important, particularly in southern Tanzania. So, for example, here, the Barra Beg said to us that when they go out and hunt a lion, the first warrior that, that hits the lion with a spear, even if he's not the one uh, that kills it ultimately, cuts off the right front paw. And then they take this central claw and they wear it on an amulet on their arm. This guy's actually wearing two of them uh, here and here. So they go around to all these households and they explain what they did and how brave they are and they get gifts of cattle and they get women to sleep with them. So it's the same that drives human behavior the world over, money and sex. And so not surprising, but it was so important that we had to know that. There were also really important myths that we understood about man-eating. This was a man that we patched up at our camp after an attack. Southern Tanzania has a lot of man-eating attacks. I realize I'm not really selling it in this talk, Southern Tanzania. It's a nice place. But... Um, but this is, interestingly, when a human is attacked by a lion in these places, often the lion isn't blamed. They say there are spirit lions. And these spirit lions are ones that have been tricked or sort of bewitched by somebody from a rival tribe to come and to attack that person. So this actually reflects intertribal conflict rather than actual conflict with the lion. And there's also a real lack of conservation awareness. You know, it's like going into somebody here and saying, you know, pigeons are really endangered. And everyone's like, OK. Um, so... We sort of understood the complexity of these conflict in these sites, and this differs site by site. But it's really important to co-develop benefit programs with those people, and these benefits have to make sense to them. So, for instance, here, the key benefits that they wanted was investment in education, healthcare, and veterinary medicine. Those are, the, you know, the same things any one of us would probably want if we were a remote pastoralist. So, as Lion Landscapes, we support um, over 16 schools now with educational materials. We, so, we've really invested in primary schools, we also, though, recognize that a lot of students can't go on to secondary school. So we've provided over 60 Simba scholarships so far to take them all the way through secondary school. This is the only time we've gone against the community because the community said to us, we do not want girls to have these scholarships. They will get pregnant, they will get married. It's a waste of education. And we said to them, all the data shows that even a year of secondary school education has a lifelong benefit for a girl. So we are going to invest in girls' education. And now, interestingly, we've had those first girls go all the way through. Now we're funding some of them to go through college. And the mothers of those girls came up to me at camp one day, and they said they brought these eggs in a little gourd, and they said this is to represent sort of the first scholars that have gone through, the first girls. And they've gone through, and they're now going on to get jobs and to go to college. And they said it's really changing how people can think about, about female education in particular. We also realized that we weren't getting enough people through the scholarship program, so there's still some problem at the primary school level. And when we talked to the teachers, they said... It's, um, it's a lack of food. These children are walking to school. They don't have food before they go. There's no food at school. So they're just hungry all day. So we've started a porridge project at three schools. We feed at the moment over 1,000 children every day. It means that more children go to school because it's, they're guaranteed a, a square meal. And it may, also the attendance and the attainment in those schools has really gone up a lot. So that's been hugely significant. We also enable access to better medical care with a particular focus on maternal and neonatal care because those are two huge priorities for local people. We also, because veterinary care was a massive sort of priority, we worked with um, local people and the local sort of veterinary infrastructure to enable be better access to veterinary medicines and how to identify actually which diseases are killing people's livestock. So this was all going on for several years and we were all very happy about it. And people would wave at us and we felt all pretty pleased with ourselves. But we discovered that people were still killing the wildlife at pretty much a similar rate. And it was very obvious that people were linking the benefits to the project but they weren't linking them, clearly, to the actual presence of wildlife. And so doing what any one of us would do, taking the benefits and still laying out the poison, laying out the snares, whatever. At the same time, we were trying to do camera trapping for our ecological work. So these remote cameras that you put out, and they take a picture as the wildlife moves past them. And those were getting stolen by the local communities because they weren't engaged in, 
in the program. And so we thought, we've got to be able to do better than this. So actually, we brought both programs together into something we call community camera trapping. And we give it, gave the villagers the camera traps, and they started monitoring wildlife on their land. And we came up with a points-based system where each picture of a wild animal will get a certain number of points. This took a huge amount of time with the communities to develop how many points each image should get. I thought it was going to be a simple thing, one to five points. People said, you're being too cheap. We want thousands of points. And I was like, well, it doesn't really matter because you're, because they're competing against each other in groups of four. But I was like, whatever, why am I arguing? You know, it's fine, fine, have a thousand points. So a dick dick, this tiny antelope, gets a thousand points. And then more wildlife is given, so the more conflict-causing species and the more endangered species get more points. So for instance, any kind of primate will get 1,500 points. It's done per individual, so this will get them 1,000 points and then 1,500 points. We are obviously biased towards large carnivores, so um, spotted hyenas will get you 10,000 points. It's also usually the last picture before your camera trap is eaten. <laughs> a lion will get you 15,000 points, and the top spot is the African wild dog at 20,000 points. This is per individual animals I mentioned, so this was just a gold mine for the village, seriously. <laughs> so there's a den of wild dogs, there's 17 wild dogs in this picture, um, 340,000 points in this village. This used to be a hot spot um, of snaring and poisoning this little waterhole because it was the only place that all the wildlife came. Now it's protected. They've legally protected the camera traps there because they know they can get all these points um, every month. We get zero points for snared animals. Often snaring is a major concern. So if you see an animal like this, we don't have any points for it. And we get extra points now for highly traded species like pangolins. So that to really try and incentivize the protection of those, keeping them alive rather than dead. And those points every three months are translated into additional community um, benefits aimed at local priorities. So again, mainly healthcare, education, and veterinary benefits. And these can be really significant locally. And we've really seen this program increase tolerance for wildlife on village land. The camera traps and the sightings show us that we're having sustained levels of large carnivores on village land. And we also, for instance, this was a pangolin that was caught in the village and they were very, very worried it was gonna be taken away. And they said, we want it still here because we want it to go past all the cameras and get all the points. <laughs> I think they wanted to train it or something, but no. So we released it back again. But the villagers were really committed to actually getting it back out there. <clears throat> and this approach now, it's been featured by the IUCN Human Wildlife Conflict Task Force. Um, it's now being, we've shared it with multiple different projects, and it's now being used internationally in numerous different countries to try to incentivize conservation. It's also been really important because the women have been engaged all the way through about trying to make sure that their benefits are the ones that are really represented here. And we've seen this be really powerful. So we've had instances, for instance, where the young men go out to hunt a lion or an elephant and the women get to be able to pull them back in. It's something we could never do as a project. And they've said, you are killing the very thing that is enabling us to give birth safely and educate our children, so we're not having it. So the women in at least one village that I know of have now put in bans on lion and elephant hunting on those village lands because they could see it was you know, really affecting the benefits. But there are many other things that we've got to deal with. Cultural issues is a major one. This idea of lion killing in particular um, being generated, generating wealth and status. So particularly for Barabaig, originally you had to kill a lion, an elephant, a buffalo, or a non-Barabaig person to get these benefits. And we were genuinely a bit worried at the beginning. You know, are we literally going to increase murder rates? We haven't seen it so far, but there's a lot of murder that goes on here. It's a, it's a genuine issue. Um, but so we said to the warriors, so we worked with lion guardians up in Kenya, and we said, Let's talk to the Barabag and see which benefits they would actually matter to them about getting status from conservation, getting money from conservation. So we said, we can employ you. We employ them as warriors, sort of being these traditional warriors where you're meant to protect your community. You're meant to ha be the guy that people go to. You know, you're meant to have high status. And so we, would em we employ about 17 warriors at the moment to go out and to track lions. If they see lions around, they chase them away. Um, they are really protective of their community. And so we said, this can get you the wealth. You, know, you will have a job every month. We would pay them on, on market days. So they could go to the market and buy cattle. But we said, but how can we get you status? There is really hard to come up with something that, in my mind, would replicate the status that comes with going out and killing a lion with just a spear. Um, and they said the one thing that would really make a difference is learning how to read and write. They said only one person in the village can do it, and that person is all-powerful. Because you know, every time someone needs a form field or something, everyone goes to them. So we said, fine, so now we taught all of those to read or write. They can now read and write some English as well. They've got passports, they travel, they get the training. So this has been hugely important. We then moved on to things like the man-eating myths, and this was much more complicated. We thought, well, how on earth do you, do you deal with something like this that's so much about intertribal communication? And we realized, of course, the only thing that actually cross-cuts across tribes, across, um, to some extent, age groups, is football. 
And so we've been giving them kits, we gave footballs, we just, and this is really sort of soft conservation in that, you know, people were just given this kit and enabled to have these village teams. They just start to discuss it. When there's a man-eating attack, people talk about it and realize it's not that the hey, hey actually came and put a spell on this barabeg person because the hey, hey guy knew somebody who was attacked by a lion as well. So it just starts that very gentle way of breaking down some of those, those hostilities. In terms of improving um, conservation awareness, we do things like taking people into the national parks. So all of these people, well, certainly in Tanzania, all these people live less than 30 kilometers from a national park. But they've never been into the national parks because you need a vehicle and because you need money. And so we take them in. It's amazing to see the impact that this can have. So people, the number one thing that we hear when people come out of these, um, par these trips is they say, I didn't know wildlife could be gentle. You know, they've seen lions with their young, they've seen elephants with their family members, and it really has this very pervasive impact on people. And also seeing these Westerners fly in, and they get this real pride that people are coming in and wanting to actually engage with their wildlife. We also show educational DVD nights. So this, you know, people are so thrilled because, of course, they don't get to see films, you know, and they really want us to show them, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a recent film now, but... Um, now, I can't at all, <laughs> and there's literally hundreds of them. But anyway, they want us to show them Star Wars. I know that's not recent, don't mock me online. Um, but they want us to show them some sort of film, but of course we show them wildlife education things, and, and that really engages them as well. But one of the big issues that we find is that almost all these great films that we show them, if we show them BBC films or Nat Geo films, they're all in English. And even if you have somebody translating them, it gives a very clear message, this is not your story. This is not for you. And it, I think that's very damaging. And we've whined to everyone that will listen to me, which is this increasingly small part of people, um, about the need to develop this. And we're actually starting to develop our own local language films because it's so important this is done. And that representation and inclusion of people in their own conservation stories is critical. So the small way that we could deal with it is we started writing these local story books. So these are books that explain about the project in local languages. So this one's in English and in Swahili. And it features the Barabaig. And they were like, this is the first time we've ever seen ourselves in a book. And they helped us, you know, write it. They helped us do all the illustrations. They were so pleased to have this. This is now going out to thousands and thousands of local households as a literacy aid. It goes to schools. And it just engages them in the project and shows that it is truly their story. And we are just hot off the press this week. We've now got Haika the Hyena Friend. This is all about poisoning and, and hyenas and vultures from, um, from a Maasai girl's perspective. And this is a really important way of engaging people. So we have this strong focus on particularly African conservation leadership. This is both within our teams. We've really, really tried to build as much capacity and skills training and professional development as we can, and externally. So Lion Landscapes is part of what we call the Pride Lion Conservation Alliance. And we, just before COVID hit, had this amazing training in East Africa of 30 incredible women conservation leaders from across Africa, and really just building this network of skills training and ability. And we know that this work can have real impact. So we know that in our core area, the depredation has reduced by over 60%. And most importantly for us, the carnival killing has reduced by over 70%. And Julius, who's here in the middle, has just been analyzing now the impacts of particularly the CCT program on people's perceived costs and benefits. And, and we're really seeing some positive changes from that. But despite this impact on conservation, for me, I think, even though I went into this as such a wildlife person, it's hugely important to know that it's having really positive benefits for real people and wildlife. So just a couple of small examples. To get into our Simba Scholarship Program, you have to have livestock because we wanted to tailor it towards pastoralists. And so this one girl uh, came in, and she was very bright. She came into the program, and her mother had three cattle. It was just her and her mother as a single parent family, so already extremely vulnerable in these sorts of places. She went into school, and then the mother's livestock got um, some kind of disease and all died. And that was really a huge loss of status in these communities. And for women in particular, lone women, it often results in those women being killed as witches. And so there was a big risk to this woman. And some of the staff came and said, well, you know, this woman's probably going to die. And, and, you know, and she no longer meets the criteria, so let's, let's take the girl out of the scholarship program. I thought, okay, well, maybe let's call that plan B because it's not the most compassionate approach. Or we could go to a donor, talk to someone, and maybe get some money in so this woman could have more livestock. So we talked to a donor who then agreed to get this woman six cattle. So she sort of came back and was stronger. Then after the first year, this girl was a great student. After the first year, she was raped, really common, and got pregnant. And girls are not allowed to go through school in Tanzania when they're pregnant. And so they said, again, she's got to drop out of school. And we had this very 
careful sort of work around with some of the local education authorities to enable this girl to get education even when she was pregnant. And then the mother helped raise the baby uh, while this girl still came back to school and has done incredibly well and has now gone through and is getting uh, her college scholarship now. And then similarly, we've got a, another woman, Grace, who came through. She was one of our Simba scholars. And she's just amazing. She's gone all the way through the program. She's now come out and she's now a research assistant for the project. And there's no one better to talk about the impact of this work than someone like a Simba scholar who is from the community and has really seen that benefit. So it's really exciting when I see those kinds of benefits. It's hard to write up on a paper. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't sort of ripple further, but it's really nice to see those impacts. But I think we shouldn't be... You know, we shouldn't sell these things as huge successes all the time. They are really complicated and they are hard. I think a lot of the complexity that keeps me up at night with conservation is the fact that all too often we are relying upon poverty. We need these people to be living on less than a dollar a day so that our small amount of conservation funding matters to them. So we can use that little bit of funding as a lever. And to me, there's a huge amount of inequality and you know, unethical behavior about that. If they get richer through something else, then our ability to leverage conservation really drops down. So how do we deal with that? So that's something that really I haven't got an answer to, but it's something that, that, we're, that we are thinking about a lot. There are also unintended consequences. I talked about um, the barabake, how they used to kill lions and elephants, or elephants. Now we are genuinely seeing the numbers of elephant killings going up. So the lion killings have gone down a lot, but the elephant killings are going up. So this is something that we hear about in the villages. So this idea of switching so that you get status somewhere else, you know, it's something that you just have to be aware of. You, know, you monitor your own impacts, but thinking about those unintended consequences and then how to try to tackle those is something I think we should be much more open about and really open to discussing. There are also real risks that if you have lower poverty, it can result in more livestock. And as a conservationist and ecologist, livestock is often a real driver for habitat degradation. So how do we deal with this when you've got you know, this sort of whole cycle of wealth resulting in poverty and relying on poverty. So we need to change the current wealth drivers, and we're going to have a really complicated graph here just to warn people about it. So these are goats. So you have goats, it equals money, and that leads often to having more goats. Now, if you have lions, again, hard, um, that does not lead to more money and often actually takes away from the money. And then that results, unsurprisingly, in people wanting fewer lights. So this is the current situation across huge amounts of areas that we work in. So we have to change this. We have to change the paradigm, really. We have to really move so that conservation efforts are no longer just relying on trying to alleviate poverty a little bit, trying to just lessen that edge. We have to think much more about actual wealth creation and really move it up a notch in terms of what we're thinking about with conservation. And critically, ideally, in many places, that wealth should really be decoupled from the existing focus on livestock numbers rather than maybe healthy livestock and quality livestock. And that's something that is a massive cultural shift in some of these areas that may or may not happen. But ideally, even beyond that, the wealth should be coupled much more with biodiversity. So a real focus so that ensuring that people can benefit properly and fairly from their natural resources and their wildlife. So we are working on that in various ways. So, for instance, we've developed something called Lion Carbon. Carbon offsetting is something you will all know about. That, and this is actually a huge potential revenue stream for people in these remote areas. So there's a group called Biocarbon Partners that works to deliver um, carbon credits. In Zambia, it's been really, really impactful in delivering millions of dollars to affected communities. But often there's a risk that these carbon credits could result in empty forests if you're just focusing on the... On the, on the carbon rather than the biodiversity. So we did a sort of a biodiversity add-on that we called Lion Carbon, a premium carbon product that people paid a little bit more for, and some of that revenue went directly back into lion conservation. So that's good that we can see these sort of nudges towards um, carbon credits that actually incorporate biodiversity, but we need to go further. So we're now developing something we're calling carnivore credits, which is, again, a verified, certified process. And this is something that carbon credits have, is that verification, that certification. And we've got to make sure that we develop this for biodiversity as well. So this is making sure that we calculate the value of biodiversity in a landscape, that we then have companies buy it, who have it truly verified, and then we, have, we make sure that that actually goes straight into sustainable conservation and to local empowerment um, sort of programs. We also want to make sure that this doesn't necessarily replace existing revenue streams or make people feel they haven't got the choices to use their land uses. So for instance, livestock is really important in many of these areas. They're often pastoralists, in Kenya in particular, this is outside formally protected areas where livestock is really important. So 
We've been developing this, um, a program called Lion Friendly Livestock, and this is a way of trying to not look here at necessarily a premium product, because there isn't a Kenyan market for a premium product, but looking instead at making that supply chain much more efficient so that we can make sure that people get more value for their livestock and it incentivizes them if they sign up for a particularly sort of biodiversity friendly way of farming. And critically with this program, we really ensure that small stock are included as well. A lot of the existing sort of premium meats products out there are beef ones, but for women in particular, they tend to rely on small stock. So we've got to include the small stock in here, we've got to include the women. And so lion-friendly livestock, which we are piloting at the moment, is something where we're, we're including both those biodiversity credits and um, lion-friendly livestock certification criteria. And the people that engage in those will get more money back in their pockets, either through a premium or just through a more efficient process. And then show that actually farming in that biodiversity-friendly way can enable them to keep that heritage, to keep farming, but also we can maintain wildlife in those coexistence landscapes. And that's really important that it's not seen as one or the other. This is a way of encouraging biodiversity across these different landscapes. So going right back to the start of this, when we think of people, you know, chipping lion faces out of woolly mammoth ivory or carving, you know, lion tableaus into cave walls, I think to me it really shows how important and how central these species were to their, to their landscapes. And right now I think we have the issue that the, wild, the value of these species is still there, but that value has become divorced from the presence of animals in the landscape. The value is felt almost entirely internationally and externally, whereas the costs are felt locally, and whereas the value tends to be depleted there. So we've got to change the system. We've been doing some of these models I've been talking about this evening, and some of these can really help, and many others out there as well, many that Wild Crew Projects are doing and many other places besides, are really trying to ensure that that value is not just felt externally, that that value comes right down to the people living alongside wildlife, so that we make sure that they are the ones that benefit from it. And it doesn't mean it has to be just financial. We can get back to more of that existence value, the cultural value, but recognizing it needs more value, it needs proper value, and needs diverse value in today's world. And hopefully by doing that and by investing in those kinds of approaches, we can have a much more secure future for both wildlife and for people as well. Thank you very much.